Hello and welcome to One Last Match, the show that allows ex-footballers the chance to have that final game just the way they like. Now, I'm your host, Mark Benstead, and each week we feature a different legend of the game as they talk through exactly how they would have liked their last game to have gone. Now, this week, we'll speak to former Liverpool and Republic of Ireland midfielder Jason McAteer. But first, let me tell you about our sponsors. Uh, who knows wins are changing the way that you enjoy sport. It's the social sporting app that allows you to make your predictions in a league against your friends, your family, colleagues, simply anyone. And of course, there's real money on the line. Or of course, you want you can join one of the public leagues and pick your wits against the Who Knows Wins community, which now has over 10,000 players. You can download the Who Knows Wins app on the App Store or Google Play and get a piece of over the quarter of a million pounds that's been won so far. So put your money where your mates are and Who Knows Wins. But let's kick off one last match now with Jason McAtee. OK, welcome to One Last Match. This is the show that gives former players the chance to pull on the boots one last time and bow out of the game exactly the way they wanted to. No dodgy knees, no empty League Two grounds. They get to wrap things up on their terms. They get to pick the perfect stadium, their starting lineup, and who they want to play. Uh, on this episode, I'm joined by a man who went from uh, part time to Premier League. He played in the League Cup final, an FA Cup final, and went to two World Cups. In fact, his goal against Holland pretty much booked Ireland's place at the finals in 2002. He went on to win 52 caps in total for his country. It's Jason McAteer. Jason, welcome aboard. You make um, it sound so clinical, like it's the end. Like, that's end it. I can never speak about footy again after this. You can't. You, you not tell you that? No. This and I'm it. not allowed to talk about the goal against You can Colin talk about the goal. Because according to someone, I'm living off it uh, for the next 30 years. We might get to that and him. Well, I've got a li another 12 years to go, <laughs> if that's <laughs> the case, because it's only been about 18 years, hasn't it? But yeah, go on. Yeah, he might come up, Mr Keane, through the course of this, you feel. Um, OK, let's <laughs> just go back to, to calling time on your actual career. Do you remember... Wrapping things up, you were kind of mid thirties. It finished up at Tranmere. Why was that the, the right time for you to to wrap it up? Well, it wasn't. It was someone else made the decision <laughs> by not giving me a contract, basically. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, so I'm still available. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why I didn't want it to be the end. Um, I'll go back actually, because I'll start at the beginning of the end. So we were in the Championship, Mick McCarthy, Sunderland, and my contract was up at the end of the season, and we were midway through the season and I went in to see Mick and I was on about because I like you I'm going to be very honest in this um, in this podcast what we're doing um, I was on about 12 maybe 13 14 grand a week which was okay money um, and Mick come to me and he said I can give you another year now so effectively, you'll be on like 18 months the end of the, to the end of the season and then another season. Um, but I'll give you five grand a week. And we were going for a promotion. And I said to him, well, if we get promotion, and I thought we'd go up. Mm. I thought we were good enough to go up. I said, you know, I'm actually going to kill myself a little bit money-wise because I'm going to be on championship, even League One money, but back in the Premier League. So I'll tell you what, I'll gamble. And I'll come back and see you at the end of the season and we'll negotiate a contract then on where we are, Premier League or Championship. So he said, OK. Anyway, it panned out. We got to the playoffs. We were beaten by Palace at home uh, on penalties. I missed the penalty, but it wasn't the penalty that cost us. That was Jeff Whitley. Um, who tried to do a little bit of a penenka as a, as a decisive penalty. That's, who does that? That's a bad move. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway... It was saved, and uh, in fact, it wasn't saved. It was just caught <laughs> like that, dead easy. Anyway, the next day, Mick was obviously um, had the players in mm. talking about who he was going to keep, who he was going to let go, what was going on. But I'd done a press conference after the game, and I kind of questioned Bob Murray's not integrity, but whether he was going to put his hand in his pocket and whether he, he was going to give Mick more investments to to tweak this team that was good enough to go up the season after. Um, and I believe Bob wasn't too happy with things that I'd said, questioning him, because he had put a lot of money into the football club, but I was a little bit sore and a little bit delicate at the time. You know, We'd just been knocked out of the playoffs, um, having put so much into that season. So I can understand, looking back now, why he might have been disappointed with what I said. So I go in to see Mick a couple of days later, um, and he, he was, I mean, me and him are very close, as you know, 
And he just put it on the table. He just said, there's no contract here. I can't give you anything. And I said, well, what about the five grand? <laughs> and he went, no, I, I can't give you that either. So basically, my time at Sunderland was up. So I didn't want to fall out with Mick. It wasn't his, I felt it wasn't his decision. Mm. Um, you know, we give each other a big hug. And when we parted ways, I went to Leicester um, and I talk, talked with Mickey Adams, um, spoke about the contract, everything was sorted. I went for a medical and I failed a medical. I failed a medical on, on my groins. I'd had them done about six months before and I played a lot of football from getting fit to, to actually finishing the end of the season and them talks with Leicester. Uh, and they were inflamed and they, were, they didn't look great, my groins. And Leicester had a few problems with signings. They'd made, put them on big money and they got injured. So I can understand their point of view. So the contract was, was taken away from me. I failed the medical, basically. Um, and I was driving home and I was just sort of thinking about what I was going to do with my career. You know, was I going to finish? Was I going to accept going maybe into League One? Um, and I thought to myself, right, what I'll do is I will look at it as a, as a learning curve of going into management and coaching. So I will step down, but wherever I go, mm. I'll say to the manager, I want to be a player coach. I want to be in, I want one foot on a coaching side and I'll play as well. But I don't want a lot of money. So I rang Brian Little at Tramia, spoke to my agent, told him what I fancied doing. He was okay, we'll go with that. And I spoke to Brian Little at Tramia and I said to Brian, listen, give us a couple of grand a week um, and I want to come as a coaching, on the coaching staff as well as a, as a player. You know, if you want me to do the reserves, that'll be great. And he said, okay, he said, obviously we've got people in positions, but when that position becomes available, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. So I went for talks with him, ironed it all out and signed for Tramia. Do you regret the gamble? At Sunderland, you know, do you think you, you wish you'd taken the contract from Mick? Right maybe, at the beginning, yeah, right at the start of that. Do you think it would have acted acted out differently? I probably wouldn't have played as much as I wanted to. You know, at Tramier as well. In my head, when I when I made the call, was I'm going to play a lot more football, mm -hmm. and I kind of that's what I wanted as well. I didn't want to go be at Sunderland, sit on the bench with no direction, and I'm playing only now and again. It would have been too frustrating. So I probably. Yeah, I'm probably glad that that didn't pan out that way, really. So, no, I, I don't have any regrets doing it the way I did it. And then, unfortunately for me, Ronnie Moore came in. And ironically, um, I spoke to Lorraine Rogers, who was the chief executive at the time of the football club, um, and she had a shortlist. And I remember saying to her, you know, Ronnie had played at the football club. Sometimes it's better the devil, you know. And, um, and she, hired, she hired Ronnie. But unfortunately, Ronnie seen me, my take on it is Ronnie seen me as a, as a threat to his job. But I never wanted the Tramia job. I was happy doing the reserves. Um, I was probably 35, 36. I was happy playing for Ronnie when he needed me. I was at that stage in my career. Um, but when my contract ran out, which was the end, mm. I went in to see Ronnie and he said, there's nothing here. And I said, well, what about a staff contract? Because you have two contracts. Yeah, yeah. You have a staff contract, you have a playing contract. The playing one was up. The staff one was up uh, and I said to him, well, I understand you might not want me to play in the team but as a player, but what about a staff contract? I've done the resis, you know, I've helped you out with the first team. Is there anything here? And he just went, no. And that was the end. And I literally walked out the football club and that was the end of my career. Was that difficult? It was very difficult and, you know, we're friends, we're very close. You know, you know the story behind it, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately for me to bring an end to a career, which wasn't really my decision. Mm. Um, you know, it's okay for the first month because everyone goes on holiday and it's pre-season and, you know, you kind of live like a footballer still. You go on holiday at the same time and there's kind of half of you hoping that the phone rings so you've got a decision to make. But there wasn't any decisions to make. So six weeks afterwards, um, unfortunately, uh, I, I ended up getting clinically depressed and... Um, and it was tough. You know, it was a tough 18 months coming back from that. Mm. And um, and yeah, we got through it. Yeah, but it was a, it was a very very difficult time. I mean, I've lightened it to a, to a light switch. You know, one day you're at a football club, you've got 25 mates, everything you need medically. Um, you've got an, an agent who's working for you. You've got a great set of friends outside of the football club because you're a footballer. Or you think they're a great set of friends. 
Um, and then you you go home, that light switch is turned off, meaning the contract's not there. You can't go back into the football club. All the players are, are doing their own thing. Your mates drift off one by one. And then you realise that you've got to stand on your own two feet and you're living in the in the real world because you do live in a bubble as a footballer. You, you know, it's it's a great life, but when you come out of it, it can be tough. And, um, and I found it really, really tough. Difficult to, to step away, difficult to wrap it up, I guess. Most footballers would like the chance to, to play one more game. That's the kind of effect of what we're trying to do here. If yeah. you had the chance to, to play your final game again, give the choice of any of the stadiums you played at, where would it be? It would be Old Wembley. Mm -hmm. So can I have Old Wembley? Yeah, you can have Old Wembley. You because I've done Old New Wembley, Wembley yeah. yeah. I've done New Wembley, don't like it. Very corporate, yeah. very like... I don't like it. Too manufactured. There was a lovely feel to the Old Wembley. Yeah. I was lucky enough to play there a few times. Um, the walk from the dressing rooms mm. up the tunnel as you come out at the end of the pitch behind the goal, mm. wasn't it? So you've got the whole arena in front of you, stadium, ground. Wembley was a good old ground. Um, it was just a phenomenal feeling walking out to that noise. Phenomenal. And then the, the long walk across the pitch to do the, the national anthems, mm. um, you know, is, is a very emotional moment. You know, great feeling, adrenaline. Um, so it'd be, it would be old Wembley. Obviously, every match you have to have the journey to the match. You're on the bus. Oh, what are we playing for? Play, it's your goodbye. So you can play for what you Champions want. Champions League final. Champions League final at Wembley. I'll give you that. Champions League, to be fair, it might be going there again soon. So, you know. Champions League option. final, old Wembley. Old there Wembley. You there you go. You're Scene on the way. set. Bus is going to the ground. Okay, so, so they don't have to make the team, they could be on the bench. And they could be useless, but you like them. <laughs> so who would you want to be sat next to? I'm lucky enough to, to have some amazing friends, real friends from football. Um, you know, you have a lot of acquaintances. Um, but to, to finish with the amount of friends that I do have, you know, I'm quite privileged in that respect. Um, although there was a lack of medals in the cabinet, I have got quite a number of really, really good friends. Um, who bring a lot to my table, whether it's help, whether it's laughter, whether it's you know going out, whether it's serious. So I'm I'm quite blessed with that. But if I had to have one fella sitting next to me go into this game, it'd have to be Aldo. It'd have to be John Aldridge, just because his his, his take on life, how we, we share the same humour. He's you know he's. He's, he just knows my personality as well. Um, and I just love him to bits. So if I was going for one last match in that moment, obviously you, you're left with this great memory at the end of it. Um, John Aldridge sitting next to me on the way to the bus. I'm not saying he'd get in the team, but he, I'd have him sitting next to me on the bus. Why, 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 why him though? Why, why, why would he be the person? Because obviously like, there's a bit of a generation gap. He's a bit older than you, so you're not necessarily the two people you associate. Why would you pick it? Why, why have you got on so because well? Because I, I, feel, I feel, obviously playing in some massive games, I, I used to, it was a love-hate, that, that moment, leaving the hotel on the bus to go to the game. There's, a, there's usually a, a half an hour. They try and keep it to about half an hour, the coach mm -hmm. journey in, in timing um, for... for just so you're not on the bus for too yeah. long, sitting down. So the um, the coach journey, obviously we'd have a police escort because of the enormity of the game. <laughs> um, and it is London traffic, so it is half an hour. So um, so I, a lot of things go through your mind in that half an hour. You question a lot of things. You try and relive moments that you've done as a footy player. All positive stuff. Um, you know, There's a lot of looking out the window and... You're just trying to get ready for this game. So there's a lot of adrenaline and a lot of emotion pumping around the head. You know, it's, it's quite a quiet bus journey mm -hmm. because no one, everyone's just getting in their own mindset. But I just think having John sat next to me, I just think would help with that journey because I think we'd have a laugh on the way. Um, he'd take my mind off the enormity of the game. Um, he's obviously been in that situation himself. Um, and I just think he would... I just think he would help that situation because I wasn't a, I wasn't a lover of that that moment, that half an hour. I'm one of them hotel, want to get on the pitch and play. Mm. So that in between is horrible time. Mm. You don't distract us. You've got you've got yeah. a guy to sit next to on the bus. You've got yeah. the game you want to play. You've got the stadium you're going to. Yeah. 
We'll get to your team in a second. Okay. Who's in the dugout? All the managers you worked under, who would you have in charge of that game? Who would I have in charge of that game? So you've got Mick McCarthy, you've got Roy Evans, Graham Souness, Gerard <laughs> Houllier. <laughs> who would you choose? No, all the... <laughs> no. Um, no, not Graham. Although I do get on with Graham now. Uh, Didn't we've, always. No, we've kissed and made up. We had a we had a real tough time at Blackburn, me and Graham. Um, as fact, I'd go, go as far to say, and I use this word very sparingly, uh, and it's a tough word. I hate them. <laughs> I hated them. What, what, what was he like to play? You know, everyone sees Graham soon as this. Was he as tough as a manager as he was as a? As if a he liked you, or? you were all right. If mm. he didn't like you, he, you'd know about it. Why didn't he like you? I think he thought, coming from Liverpool, um, my personality. I think he found it difficult to handle. You know what I'm like, I was always, you know, in for a joke. It was like, not always a messer, but at the right time. You know, I, I did take it very seriously at times. Um, I think he thought, you know, I should offer more to the, to the team when really, you know, mistakes sometimes he'd point out in meetings where mine was, it wasn't my fault to be like three people who give the ball away before me, but it was my fault the goal went in, even though I wasn't on the pitch probably <laughs> sometimes. Um, he, he was one of them, Graham. He was always first to point a finger at me. He was always first to make things difficult for me. Not really too sure. I can't really answer that. Um, maybe he thought he was going to get more out of me the way he handled me, but he was—he got it wrong. Was he still? Was he? Was he joining in sessions still? Then was he getting involved around yeah. stuff, or was he? Yeah, yeah, he was joining in sessions then. Was that weird? No, because I just wanted to smash him every time, <laughs> but I couldn't get near him. He was that good. I couldn't get near him. Um, yeah, I, I grew to dislike him very, very quickly. And um, that's, not a great, that's not a great relationship for a player-manager, is it? Because <laughs> so, he always wins. Because I want to yeah. play and he picks the team. So, and he used to do this thing, right, where, say I was in form, he'd have to play me. And he'd always bring me off for like 70, 75 minutes. He'd do my head in. And I, I might have been putting like a man-of-the-match performance in. He'd drag me off. He'd just drag me off. And like... <laughs> it was just, I remember calling him something as I walked past him, you know, as I come off the pitch, I just called him like something beginning with the third letter of the alphabet. And um, he, yeah, it was the third letter. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> could have been the second letter. In fact, could have been the first letter. <laughs> but it was the third. And I walked past him, I called it, he didn't flinch. Did not flinch. And uh, I went straight up to the tunnel, straight in the dress, done the aisle, straight in the dressing room. On. And then uh, he pulled me on the Monday morning, we had murder on the Monday. And then um, I knew that was the end of that. And then you know the story, me trying to get out. And then I went to see him, didn't I? And then I moved to Sunderland from then. But he made life very difficult for me. So, so it wouldn't be him? No. So, so we'll cross him out. I'm going to presume it's not going to be Gerard Houllier. We'll no, because he out. sold me from Liverpool. School teacher. Yeah, another one I didn't get on with. I knew my days were numbered, right? We played crew in a pre-season friendly. And he come out on the pitch. And he was going round all the lads. And uh, I had about 30-odd caps for Ireland at this time and been the World Cup in America. And he came up to me and he went, uh, are you an international? I thought, I'm in trouble here. I said, yeah, played about 32 times for Ireland, played in the World Cup 94. OK, I thought my days are numbered. Is that hard when you think a guy isn't going to give you a chance? It's hard, you, when, surely if you're a player, it's hard when you think I'm not in his plans. If you're not in his plans, it means you're not going to play. Hmm. So then it becomes a fight then. You know, and it's like, well, who does he think's better than me? And you start questioning everything. And like, what teams are you going to pick? This is pre-season, mm -hmm. so now you're thinking, am I going to start the season? What does this, or is he going to sell me? Does he want me here? Mm -hmm. All them questions then come into your head. So it becomes difficult. Do you reckon? Which is bad, man. That's bad manage management, that is. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I, not, I would never manage like that. You learn more from the managers you didn't like. Yeah. You do. So but do you think, given your time again, you could have stuck it out? Or do you think, no matter what you did, and how well you did in training, your, your, the die was cast, you weren't going to get a first fur shot at it. I have two regrets in football. don't really live life with many regrets, but I've got two in football. One is Bono. You know that story. We might get onto it later. Um, but yeah, with, with, yeah, with the Ireland stuff, yeah. And the other one was, I think I should have given it another six months at Liverpool. I left November time and went to Blackburn. I wish I'd seen it out to the end of the season. I wish I'd just grinded it and just and let the players who were playing in my position, when I look back, I actually think they, they, were, they were playing the way out of the team. Mm. My opportunity would have come to get back in that team. 
at the time I didn't think it was going to come. At the time I thought, there's no way I'm, um, I'm going to get in this team. And that's how I felt. I had an international career to think about and I wanted to play. I couldn't sit on the bench. I couldn't do it. Even though it was Liverpool, it was my club, I felt I was, I, I just felt it was wrong. I felt I wanted to play. I felt I couldn't sit on the bench and take my money. Um, I felt I was playing for a manager that didn't fancy me and didn't want me to play. I got the opportunity. I was weak at the time. I was emotional at the time. Brian Kidd was such a nice fella. He talked me into it mm. and then got sacked. And then Graeme soon has come in. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I had it every time in football <laughs> I did. Um, I wish I just thought, grind it for six months. You'll get back in the team. I wish I had someone around me at that time who was going to say, who would have said, no, stay and fight. And I didn't, I bailed. Did, did you speak to any of the, the senior guys who were kicking around at the time to say, well, what am I going to do here? Not really, because Barnsley, Rushy and all them were kind of go. They were, yeah. they were leaving a football club. So we were kind of the older ones then. It was like me, Jamie, Babsy, uh, Macher, Robbie. And the other thing is, it's like, you know, when you play for Liverpool, it, it does sound selfish, but you do think about yourself all the time, mm. about playing and your performance. You don't really think. Like, I don't worry whether Jamie was in the team or not, or whether Jamie was going to play well, or if Robbie was, you know, if, he, if I was in the team and Jamie's in the team, of course I want him to play well because I want him to win the game. But if, if I was playing and he wasn't in the team, I wouldn't be worrying about whether he was, yeah. how he was feeling. Maybe after the game, I'd say to him, listen, you're okay, and, or we'd be out for dinner or whatever, and we'd talk about it. But we all handle things in different ways. Jamie would sulk, Jamie was a sulker. Um, but I understood that I was a sulker. You know, I sulked when I wasn't in the team. But you look after number one, don't you? Do you regret some of that sulking now? Do you think if you'd sulked less, you might have got a better shot at it? Yeah, yeah. If I, if I maybe I hadn't sulked as much at Liverpool, I might have thought I'd had a different mindset. And I was a bit like, you know, I was in international, I played in the World Cup, I played 135 times for Liverpool. You know, and Gerard Ulier had come into this football club. And Liverpool were moving into the noughties at the time in a sense of it was great, it was trying to be French, wasn't it? You know, they'd won the World Cup 98, mm. Wenger was in, Ginola, Henri, Oli Petit, they were all playing in the in the Premier League. So it was very trendy to be to be French. Mm. And Liverpool my thing with Liverpool and Rick Parry was um he wanted to move in that direction. And he wanted to move away from the old boot room, rear guard. You know, the old way of thinking for Liverpool, which I totally disagree with because it was the most successful club ever. You know, why do you move away from something that brings you success? You tweak it, but you don't move away in, in a massive step. And that's what that was. You know, um, Ronnie Moran was let go. Roy was, was, told, he was, was told he was getting an, um, a joint manager. Um, but it was quite evident that Roy's time was up. And it was a matter of moving him out slow. It was kind of a bit of a, um, we're not going to get rid of you right now, mm -hmm. but we're going to bring someone in. You're going to be joint managers. But behind the scenes, they're thinking, we're just going to move him out slowly. And that's what they did. And the day he walked in and, and resigned, mate, you've never, I didn't see a dry eye in that, in that dressing room at Melwood. Everyone was in tears. Roy was in tears. Oh, it was a sad, sad day. Even now, it upsets me thinking, thinking about that day. It was very emotional. But Gerard knew what he was doing. He knew. With that in mind, then would you would you like to would you like to put Roy in the dugout this time? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roy would be there. Roy would be in my dugout as assistant manager. Mm -hmm. I'd have Ronnie Moran as coach. I'd have Roy as assistant manager. Jack Charlton, unbelievable manager. Although it took him six months to get my name right. In fact, he thought I was Phil Babb for six months. <laughs> Phil Babb's black, as we know. How'd you get that wrong? Um, Jack loved him to bits. Great man manager. Um, knew where you stood with him. Very old school. Mm -hmm. Obviously won the World Cup, 66. So, loved him to bits. Mick, love Mick to bits, but he's more like an, an uncle. He's mm. more like my favourite uncle, Mick. But the manager I'm going to go for that gave me the opportunity and taught me a lot, and I always wanted to make him happy. All my managers, I wanted to, mm. like, obviously make them happy by, by putting in a performance. And, you know, I'd run the extra mile for Roy, run it for Jack, run it for Mick, but I'd also run it for Bruce Rioch who was a hard manager, 
but was fair, really fair. He'd say to me things like, 10 games, you give me 10 games, I'll give you a new contract. 10 games, get in, sign that. Improve me money, 250 quid. Mm. Improve me money, 500 quid. I was on 100 quid when I signed for Bolton. And he'd improve it, and he'd improve it. And he'd say to me, right, we're staying behind. And I, you know, I would never go, oh, I'm gonna end up in the traffic on the way home. You know what I mean? He's gonna mm. keep me, because I, I still lived on the Wirral and Bolton. It was a good hour in traffic, it took me an hour and a half. So he'd want me to stay behind, do extra. I knew the traffic, so I wouldn't think like that. I just think, yeah, I want to stay behind, work on my left foot, can't wait for this session. And we'd stay behind and we'd practice left foot, practice shooting, practice going through one on one. And he tried to, imp he, he made me improve because I never had an apprenticeship because I signed at 19. Mm. And, um, and then he obviously took us to um, the League Cup final with Bolton when we were in the championship, took us to a, two promotions. Um, into the Premier League, always fair with me, give me some great contracts, looked after me, always on the phone when I was at home, ringing me up, you okay? Um, after games, ringing me up, played well today, son, you just keep doing that for me. Reedy had that in his locker, Peter mm. Reed, another great manager, forgot about him. Reedy? Now I'm going Bruce. Yeah. Bruce gets in, good choice, I like that, I like that. Also, good because obviously, Gerard was quite a disciplinarian and didn't work. Bruce was also quite tough, but it worked. So it shows that you could play under one of those kind yeah. of guys. You've got him in the dugout, Roy Evo, assistant. In terms of your team then, who are you putting in goal? What formation first are you going to play? I'm going to go old school. Oh, do you know what? Because obviously wing backs. Yeah. Um, You're in the team, remember, so you've got to put yourself in somewhere. Yeah, I find it... Wing backs, wing backs is quite a unique team if you're playing an attacking three at the back with wing back, so I think it's easier to get the quality of players I've played with into a 4-4-2. Four, 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 I'm going old school, okay. call me a dinosaur, going old school. Okay, Sean Rex. Dyche, 4-4-2. Four, four, Who's in goal? Um, play with some great goalkeepers, play with some average goalkeepers. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna go Shea, mm -hmm. Shea Given. Great shot stopper, great lad in the dressing room. Not the tallest, but commanded his box very well. Just an all round great lad. Was he just one of those ones that was just just solid? You get you had solid. Kind of, you could you didn't have to worry about. No, him. you can always bank on him, bank on him, and he can play out. He was a really good like outfield player, playing him proper five good sides. Out, man. Yeah. yeah, proper good out. Yeah. yeah, get him in a five a side. You wouldn't, you know, if he was last pick, you wouldn't go. Oh, God, like if it was JMO, you'd be like, forget it. I want Anne who makes the tea <laughs> before JMO. Um, you'd think Shay, yeah, I'm Shay, yeah, okay. yeah. Shay, well, you see the other ones in there. You know, guys like like Brad Friedland. He played in both. Liverpool. No, he was at Liverpool. He played at Blackburn. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm trying. Went to on to have a great career. Was he as good then? The as cats. He out played with the cats in Flowers for a year. Yeah, great goalkeeper. Yeah, mm -hmm. another one who was mad, just mad goalies. Um, Play with some really, really good goalkeepers, yeah. But Shea gets the nod. Shea would get the nod, yeah. Shea gets the nod, okay. It's a back four. Talk us through your back four then. Am I in? You, you, you're in the team, yeah. So where you play yourself, you can put I'm yourself right front back. if you want. No, I'm going to go right back. I do prefer um, wing back. And I do like centre midfield, obviously, because I played there for Bolton a few times for Liverpool. A few, a few times for all the clubs, actually. Um, I'm probably best known as a, a wing back, but I'm going to go 4 4 2, so I'm going to go right back. Okay. We'll find out who else Jason is putting in his defence alongside him in a minute. But first, let me tell you about Who Knows Wins. If you don't know it yet, Who Knows Wins is a sports app where you challenge your friends or their community over sports results. Download the app and you can either join public leagues, they have created like the Premier League every weekend, or you can create your own custom league and invite your friends to play against you. You pick the fixtures you want to predict, the entry fee, and pick the winning team. Or, of course, you can go for draws for each game. Uh, the more people you have in your league, well then, the bigger the pot. All you have to do is pick the match winners or go for draws, and you can check out all the links on our Twitter, at One Last Match, or you can search for us on Facebook as well. Just look for One Last Match. But let's find out the rest of Jason's team now for his One Last Match. So you're right back, right? Yeah. Centre-halves. I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have Paul McGrath. Loved him to bits. Called him the genie. That was his nickname. 
because every time a bottle opened, he'd pop up. So. <laughs> <laughs> so but it's funny, like obviously Paul had his troubles and everything. Yeah. But anyone you speak to in the game about who's played with him or against him talks him up. They, they won't. They just say he was phenomenal. Was that the case? He was just an incredible defender. Incredible, yeah. That would be the word. And I think in the adversity that he went through in life, it makes it even better. If you know what I mean, mm. it makes it makes his performances even more stand out. Um, yeah, great guy. Another one of them players in the dressing room that, you know, gives you a big hug. You want to play for him. You know, you're like, you, you know, he's behind you. He's not letting you down. Um, one of them rolls his sleeves up, just gets on with it. Um, yeah, great. Just an all-round great guy, Paul McGrath. But what a player. I mean, yeah, he's had his troubles. We know that. It's been well documented. And I've been there and I've seen it myself. Um, certain situations I've been in with Paul, which are upsetting, which are disappointing, which are sad. Um, but at the time, again, it's like you look at it and think, you know, I was only a young kid at the time. You know, what what you do? You, like, you don't get involved, really. You know, the physio gets involved and the doctors and all that kind of stuff and, and they do their bit and you, you just move away from the situation. But was it a mark of how much uh, one of the good players was, but also a good guy was that everyone was willing to, to kind of go that extra mile to try and get him through it and try and get him out on that Absolutely, field? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying what I said there, you know, we moved away from it. I was a young lad and I never really experienced anything, what, I, what I'd seen kind of thing um, behind the scenes. So I was a little bit like, oh, how does he get through this? And then, you know, he comes out and plays on a Wednesday night for Ireland or whatever it was and puts in man the match performances and you just think, whoa, like that's amazing. You know, and then, and then he goes off to his club and then you read about his problems and you just think, oh, it's, it's just an amazing guy to get through that kind of adversity uh, and keep going and mm -hmm. keep putting them performances in. I mean, I've seen nothing like it. Italy, Giant Stadium, 94, first game of the World Cup, group stage. I mean, he was phenomenal. And one moment that sort of stays with you as, as a footballer, certain moments stay with you. Remember the Pele, Bobby Moore, mm -hmm. where they, they take the shirts off and they, there's mm -hmm. that great photograph. No one ever got this snap and I'm gutted, right? Because it was one of them moments and I, we were all shaking hands and we're all like we're walking around the pitch. Franco Baresi, takes his shirt off and walks to Paul McGrath, taps Paul on the back, and I remember looking, and Paul turned round, and the two of them embracing, and no one got that picture, and I just thought, oh my God, it's like Paul McGrath and Franco Baresi, but Baresi's asking Paul for his shirt, and it was one of them like iconic moments that just stuck with me, and um, that shows a measure of the man, when Franco Baresi's asking mm. for your shirt. Yeah, when the best in the business comes knocking on your door for the shirt, then you know you've done, yeah. done pretty well. I remember we played Germany, and Andreas Bremer, the great left-back play for Germany, he'd scored the winner in the 90 World Cup. We played him in a friendly, 94, before we went to America. Played him in Hanover, we beat them 2-0. Um, and I played really well, but they played a young left-back mm -hmm. on the day. And Bremer was sub. And I think at the end of the game, because I'd like played really well against this left-back, Bremer must have been like, a bit happy that he's like, took him to the cleaners a few times. And uh, Bremer come up to me like that, and he, he had his shirt in his hand. And he shook my hand and he went, this is for you. And I went like that to take my shirt off and he went, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went, all right. <laughs> I walked off. <laughs> he didn't want it. <laughs> so, uh, so swapping shirts is a big thing in my eyes. So when, when um, Berezi asked for Paul's shirt, that was like a moment. So Paul gets in. Paul gets in. Who partners him then? Tough one again, played with lots of great centre halves. Um, Richard Dunn, you've got Donati or Henningberg, guys like that. I'm going to go Cara. I think Cara, because of his height, because you know he, he went a great passer of the ball, Cara. But I think to be a centre half, but was was similar. To be a great centre half, I think you've got to read the game mm -hmm. very, very well. You've got to see mistakes before they happen. You've got to be at the right place at the right time, sometimes before they happen. Um, and Cara had that in abundance. Cara was one of the best readers of the game for me. Um, and like I said, you know, lacked, lacked in, other, in other departments. Uh, we had a great head of the ball, great tackler. Um, but his biggest attribute, Cara's, was organising and reading the game. And I think to have that alongside Paul, it was great in the air, mm. could pass a ball, also could read a game very well, um, very disciplined play with both feet. Um, I think they would, them two would make a, a great a great partnership. 
Full back, other side. Yeah. Left back. Um, Stick beyond be Ian Hart, Stan Staunton. Yeah. Um, Ian Hart was a very underrated player. Left foot was a wand. He scored a hat trick of free kicks against us in a pre season friendly once. Um, as good as Beckham on free kicks. As good as Beckham on free kicks. Um, but obviously, because he didn't play in, in a high profile team as Man United or the Leeds team was great, you know, semi final of the Champions League, etc. Mm. Um, you know, Beckham got a lot more publicity and airtime, really. But I'd put him up there with Beckham as, as a free kick taker. Uh, could put a great ball in. Penalties, never feared he was going to miss. Scored a really important penalty against Iran in the, in the playoffs for Ireland. Big pressure penalty scored. Um, never felt pressure, or I felt he, he didn't. And he was probably, he was a seven or eight man yeah. every time. Okay, Ian Hart in. Let's get to perhaps, perhaps the most difficult two positions to pick. You've gone 4 4 2, two central midfielders. No, I think it's the easiest. The easiest just in terms of the two standouts? I, yeah, I just don't think you, you can... I think it's, it's the perfect partnership. I think these two, out of everyone I played with, you know, are looked upon as two of the greatest um, for different reasons. Big, big players. Um, and I think they would walk into, at their peak, any team in the world. Any team in the world, these two would walk in. Mm -hmm. Be first pick. Um, both internationals, of course. Both won everything. Um, and for me, they would complement each other fantastically well. Got to play. Um, one is, uh, one is Steven Gerrard, and the other one is Roy Keane. On Roy, yeah, because obviously it's kind of like you know, you've joked about it, and there is this kind of like slight ongoing kind of. Yeah. Huge, but there's an ongoing bit of niggle, keeps I guess, going, though, because so, yeah. he keeps having a little yeah. pop. He did it not that long ago. Why does he still get in the team? Because, you know, some people might be a little bit, like, you know, churlish, but I'm not going to put him in. I think to be an elite sportsman, I think you've got to be made up of, of certain stuff, um, you know, whether it's attitude, aggression, petulance. You know, there's, there's lots of different attributes to make a top, top sportsman, but it's whatever works for them. You know, if it works for them and they succeed, then it's it's right. You know, it's 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 how they are. You know, I was very aggressive, said too much on the pitch, not a very nice person. But off it, I think I'm the. I like to think I'm the opposite. Um, but I had to play like that. It's what got me up for a game. It's what got me in the mood. It's what brought the best out of me as a footballer. Um, you know, I moaned. Although some people would say I'm like that off the pitch. <laughs> but that that was me. Um, Roy off the pitch, we clashed as personalities. Um, although we got on at times, you know, he, he's got a great sense of humour at the right time. Uh, you know, I used to love being in his company when he was a, when he he was a certain way. Um, but there was a lot of times when we clashed. We didn't see eye to eye. You know, he might be in a mood about something. I would be there, trying to have the bants with him and that at the wrong time probably he would take offence to that and you know we, we'd end up having words I would tease him I would humour him when he didn't want it um, you know I'd leave things on him just maybe to get a rise out of him Do you like poking the bear every so often just to I was like that yeah poking the bear is probably a good anal analogy yeah um, I was like that so I can understand why he probably didn't like me <laughs> Um, but we also had that rivalry, Man United Liverpool. You know, we didn't that play a big part? Do you think it's because the two teams at the time massively, were the... Yeah. yeah, massively, and we're both proud of who we played with. We we were both fans of you know. I'm sure he's a, a Man United fan. I'm sure he is. Um, so like we were very proud and very um, you know we were the best. We stuck up for ourselves and stuck up for our clubs, and we wouldn't have anything said about it. You know, and when we played against each other, it was. You know, sometimes you play against fellow, like Leeds, I play against Ian Hart, I'd mm. never think I'd want to smash him. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd put me, because he was on the left, I was on the right, it was always a battle. But, you know, it was fair, we'd hug each other at the beginning, we'd hug each other at the end. And if there was any word said, which very rarely there wouldn't be, you know, we got on with it. With Roy, you'd want to smash him, you'd want to hurt him, you wouldn't pick him up. You'd have words, you'd mean it. 
he wouldn't shake his hand at the end of the game. That's how he was. Do you know what I mean? And that's our, that's our relationship. But did you get on, obviously, the 2002, the World Cup, is, is like, it's one of the moments in the Irish national team's it's history. Everyone moments, talks yeah. about it. Before that, was it better? I was getting on with him. Yeah, you got on with him and you kind of... We were kind him. of the older pros then. Yeah. You know, we'd, we'd, the, the Townsends, Cascadinos, the Aldridges, Whelan's, uh, Staunton, uh, Stan was there, but he was probably, you know, him and Quinny, mm. there's myself and Roy, we were probably, Alan Kelly, we were the, the elder statesmen of, of, the, of the group. You know, it was Robbie Keane, Duffer, Breeny, Dunny. You know, the younger ones had come through then. So, you know, 94, we were then. So it was a lot more, oh, there was a lot less pressure on us, a lot more, and it was a lot more enjoyable back then. 90, 2002 was a lot more pressure, we, we had to deal with the press a lot more. Um, but we were getting on, me and Roy, we got on before we went. You know, our relationship was, at a good, was in a good point, position, it was in a good, good place. Um, but the pressure had started when he never turned up for Niall Quinn's testimonial, which was a warm-up game for us. You know, the press were on him. And the press were a lot more demanding you know, the 94, what they, you know, it's 2002, a lot more stories, they dig a lot more. There was, you know, if he'd, if he'd have never turned up to say, I don't know, John Aldridge's testimony on 94, no mm. one would have battered an eyelid. But in 2002, the demand for stories and digging and, you know, putting a spin on a story, all of a sudden it's, well, why isn't Roy Keane turning up? Is he too good for it? Mm. You know, is he this, is he that? You know, they make their own stories up and their own questions to be answered, don't mm. they, the press? So, the strain had started straight away with Roy and the squad and the competition. Do you re regret it a bit now, the way it's kind of panned out? You know, obviously teammates in a really successful Island team for a long time, two of the, the main players at big moments. The fact that there's kind of that bit of niggle. I, I guess you're not the only one. He probably doesn't get on with quite a lot of that group now. But do you regret that the way it's kind of panned out a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite sad about it, yeah. And, I, you know, I'm being completely honest in this interview. Um, and I'll be completely honest, I'm actually gutted for him that he missed that competition. He was, he was arguably the best centre cent midfielder in the world at the time. And he was going to a tournament that actually was wide open. Germany weren't great. Brazil, you know, they were the, obviously the favourites. But there was a lot of teams there in, in a bit of a transitional period, ageing. You know, I'm not saying we would have gone on to win it, but mm. I'd like to think that we got knocked out in pens by Spain. We missed a pen in normal time to go through. Um, I just think maybe having him on the pitch might have been that little bit more that we needed to get through. You know, we plotted our, we actually plotted our way at one point to the semi-final. You know, we, we would have played South Korea we, if we'd have beaten Spain. We would have played Germany again. We, we didn't fear them. We, we drew 1-1 with them in the group stage. So, you know, having Roy there in the moment he was in would have obviously enhanced the team and made us better. But it's all ifs, buts and hindsight. Do you think in hindsight he would have bitten his lip and stayed on? Knowing the way things panned out, do you think he regrets it? Do you think, or do you think he would have still do the same thing again? Roy lives by his decisions and, and like a, you know, he, had, he had a reason to go home. He made his point and he stood by it and his decision was, I'm going home. And he will stand by that now. He's like, he will be right. He's right. That's the thing with Roy, he's right. But everyone else's eyes, he's, he's wrong. You know, I, I personally think he should have bit his lip. There's a time and a place for the debrief. We get his arguments. We get the situation. We understand where you're coming from. But let's get on with it. You know, we've got three games to get out of a group. If we do, who knows where it's going to take us. We've got a great set of lads. You know, can it for a month? Can it for three weeks? Do it when you get back. You know... And I, and, I, and I really regret that he went home because he, he missed out on, on a World Cup in a moment when he was one of the best centre midfielders in the world. And I'm gutted for him. He won't probably be gutted. Only he can answer that question, but the way he still goes on about it, I don't think he is. But I'm gutted for him. I'm gutted for him. And also I'm gutted that our relationship has panned out this way. In all seriousness, yeah, I have, the, I have a laugh now and... You know, I try and humour people when they ring me up and they go, Roy this, Roy that, Roy that. And yeah, I tell a few stories and, and whatever. You know, maybe tinker with the truth a little bit on the story side of things. But you know what? I, I admire him as a footballer, but I just wish, you know, sometimes things that come out of his mouth, he just stops and, and thinks there's a bigger picture to what you're saying. You're hurting a lot more people than actually the mud you throw in. There's a lot more comes with that person, with, with, for instance, the Johnny Walters situation, you know, he said his bit, 
and then he has to go that little step further to throw a little dig in about you know the mental health situation and the crimes. Just can it, Roy? Just take a step back and just you know just have a little think about what you're saying. Because deep down, I think we all do kind of like him. Mm. He's like he's like the baddie we like, isn't he? The villain we like, you know. But and I'm never saying our relationship will ever get back to the you know the good times we had maybe back then because it probably won't because he's quite stubborn. But you know. The olive branches. <laughs> he gets in the team though, nonetheless, because a cracking player alongside does, yeah. Stevie. You've got to pick two wide players. Who are you going to go for? Who's going to play in front of you? By the way, if he gets in the team, right, he's not allowed to stay in the hotel. He literally <laughs> gets on the bus, plays the game, and gets off. Right, he's not even invited to the party afterwards. <laughs> but he gets in the team. Uh, Stevie, Stevie, I don't think there's there's enough ways to, to talk about him. You know, he him for me got into the team when I was there. Um, ironically, his first squad was I got injured Newcastle away, and he was he was put in the squad. Um, so it's all my oh, it's all my doing. Yeah. Stephen Gerrard, Stephen Gerrard, yeah. the, man, the man he became. Yeah, <laughs> because it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't got injured against Newcastle. <laughs> um, yeah, so Stevie gets in the team. Phenomenal player, um, could do everything. Eight, nine out of ten. Mm -hmm. There was nothing he couldn't do, um, and carried a, um, a very average Liverpool team for a while. Um, 2005 probably is his pinnacle. The way he, he grabbed the game by the scruff of the neck. Great tactics by Rafa, but then you've got to, the players have got to then respond. Stevie did that, you know, the goal, the way he lifted everybody up, the way he brought the crowd in, you know, the way he spared players on to give them that belief they could come back from 3 0 against that AC Milan side. It was phenomenal. Um, but that's just a one off game, you know, he did it for 10 years. He's in. Who's, who's, who's in front of you on that right hand side? Maka. Stephen Steve Mack, yeah, and I give Macca a bit of a free role. I wouldn't, you know, I think the, the thing you can't do with Macca is um, discipline him into a right sider and you can't go anywhere else. You've got to, because of Keane and Gerrard, they've got the nows to cover. So, um, so I'd actually play it like it's a 4-4-2, but with Macca's free role, you could have it a 4-3-3. Right, okay. See so what I've done there? A bit of tinkering there. Yeah. Okay. So game, it's, you're versatile. That, so yeah. it's got versatility in my team. Um, so Maka plays on the right. Maka is one of them players you're getting ready in the dressing room and you look around and Maka's there as cash as you like in his undies with five minutes before kickoff, the bell's gone. Maka's in his undies and his socks, right? Not even shirt on, shorts on, boots on, nothing. In fact, he'd probably be sitting there like that in his undies, boots and socks on, reading the programme like that, right? <laughs> The buzzer goes to go out and play, and he, he, he finishes what he's reading, right? <laughs> this is how laid back he is. Puts the programme down, and right? gets up, puts his shorts on, puts his jersey on, goes round, goes into the toilet, wets his hair, hugs everyone, walks out, man of the match performance. That's Macca. Do you think he gets the credit for how good a player he was? It seems to get lost in the fact that he went to Madrid and had all the success, the Champions League. I don't know, he just never no. seems to get spoken about in the same... Same way as some other players who've had maybe not as much success. Yeah, I think from a Liverpool perspective, you know, I think a lot of Liverpool fans felt he walked out on the football club on a on a Bosman. Um, I think that that's the wrong choice of words. I don't think Maka walked out of anywhere. He went on a Bosman, fact, right? But I don't think he walked out on Liverpool Football Club. He gave Liverpool Football Club um, under Gerard Doulier, under Rick Parry. Um, I think Evo might have still been there when they negotiated a new contract. Every opportunity to, to tie him down. Maka didn't want to go. Mm. You know, he was born in Liverpool. Yeah, he's never a fan, but he was Liverpool through and through. Massive part of that that club. Um, underrated. You know, some of the things that he did. If you watch the games back, Maka was brilliant, 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 brilliant. But I know for a fact that Liverpool should have kept him at the football club. They didn't. They had umpteen opportunities to keep him at that football mm. club, and um, and they they didn't do it. And then you know I don't think Real Madrid was was the first choice. I think it was a team in Italy. I think, and then Madrid come in last minute, and um, and he took the opportunity to go to go to Real, Real Madrid, mm. like pff, two Champions Leagues, scored the winning in one. You know, probably the apart from Gareth Bale before Bale, probably the most decorated. Mm. Um, Englishman, although he's Welsh bail, but uh, yeah. British, British player abroad, yeah. to go abroad. And he's not been recognised for that. You know, I see MBEs and OBEs and whatever handed out 
to people that have only done half as much as what Mac has done. Mac has never been credited with, with what he's done as actually as a footballer um, by any kind of establishment and probably is very underrated when it comes to thinking about footy players, yeah. Mm. He's up there for me as, as the, one of the best. A couple of European Cups isn't a bad thing to bring to your team. <laughs> I go round to his house all the time. He's, he's not got a trophy cabinet. He's got a trophy room. <laughs> it's like it's like a museum. I hate going in there. <laughs> I hate it. And you've got to walk through it to get to to a certain part of the, the house. And um, I hate going walking through there. I have. Do you know what? I have stopped and had a right good look as well. Some What's of the, the best stuff, thing in there? The picture with the Pope. I think he's just with the Pope and the Pope. I think the Pope's asking for an autograph. <laughs> That's why it looks. Um, so he, he's in on the right then, playing in front of you, but a free roll. You've got your two centre mids. Who's on the opposite flank? On the left. Oh, it's tough. Well, it's mid, tough. I suppose you can be a bit, you know, you've got guys like Jamie Redknapp, Ronnie Whelan. Uh, you've got uh, two guy who was at Blackburn with you, player by all accounts. The Turkish David Beckham. Um, two, two, because a great player, yeah. Used to knock on your door smoking. <laughs> it's just like crazy. It'd be like two. Um, yeah, Patrick Berger, part of that great Czech team, played mm. for Liverpool, great left foot, great left sider. Um, Alan Thompson was a great player, you know, great left foot. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get in it though. Um, and then you've got, who else have I got on the left? I in know I'm going to put in. Um, but obviously, like, you're talking about the great names that never got in the team. Ronnie Whelan, how close he's got into my team. Kind of shoe him on. I'm not really because this player. Stick him up front if you want, but I don't know. I, do you know what? I actually think it, it's quite an easy. It's been an easy decision. I'm trying to make it difficult. Okay. The cameras. Um, <laughs> come, play with me. Play with me. Um, I'm going to go John Barnes. Barnes, he played centre midfield when I was at Liverpool, probably because of his Achilles and because of his age. He, he kind of. Bar Barnsey went from the left, moved in and back. <laughs> that's how, it was like that. That's Jay Barnsey. That's that's age. That. Um, yeah, Barnsey. Uh, I, and I speak to Aldo, and you know they all say you've seen nothing like it when he was at his peak. Sadly for me, I, I got him just underneath that, but still affected games. Did you get glimpses though? With yeah. a little moments where you thought, oh, aye, aye, I can see it. Yeah, mate, you could be in a phone box and not get the ball off Barnsey, and. Um, he was that good. In training, he demanded a lot. Like Roy, demanded. If you give the ball away, you just knew he was going to be on your back. You knew he was going to be in your face. And you didn't want to give the ball away because it was Barnsley and you knew, mm. you knew that. Um, but yeah, I mean, great two feet, predominantly left footed, but great, great right foot as well. Great way to pass, could see things. You know, he was still scoring goals uh, when I was there, but from a different position. But I just... You know, I speak to Aldo and Ronnie, and he's, they, they, they say to me, you've seen nothing like Barnsley on the left in his prime. John Barnes goes in, good choice, great player. Front two. This tends to be the, the, the positions in a team when you get these kind of all-time 11s that people struggle with most sometimes. You play there's so with many so many. Good ones, yeah. Good forwards. And it's how you want to play. You know, um, Sean Dundee obviously gets in. Obviously. <laughs> I feel a bit sorry for Sean Dundee. Yeah, absolutely mulled by everyone him, yeah. who was at Liverpool with him. Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'll put one in that he, he gets in because he's the greatest player I've played with, Robbie. Robbie Fowler gets in the team. He's the best player of all those players in that team. think he's the best. Best player I've ever played with, yeah. Sees things before you even see them. Um, does things you can only dream of doing. Um, left foot, right foot. Edda, it's only small, as you know. Um, could read the game really well. Ten yards, he was explosive. But all kinds of goals, all kinds of goals, outside the box, benders, smashes it, side foots. And you speak to him, and the, the most that give him most joy is side foots from two yards out, because he's in the right place at the right time, and that's what gives him the most joy. But for me, the goal against Villa, where he's, he croves Steve Staunton and then smashes it in the top corner, um, goal against Manchester United, Smichael near stick. The other one where he knocked Gary Neville off the ball and chipped Smichael. Mm. You know, we could go on all afternoon talking about goals Robbie Fowler scored and what he's done. But it, for me, he was, you know, as a wing, as a wing back, I was putting balls in the box into positions that he should never really get on the end of, and he'd finish it off or he'd make the cross into a, a, a bad cross into a good cross, and you know, I'd get the assist and get a little write-up as well. So, 
yeah, I've got Robbie to thank for that. Phenomenal player. Who are you going to put with him then? If Robbie's an easy choice, well, he's the best one then. I mean, you look at, do you want a big man to go with him? Because then you've got What's Niall to Quinn. You? Yeah, well, I've got Niall Quinn, who, who you can play that way. If you want to go direct, Quinny was brilliant doing that. Um, pinning players, great in the air, great you know, with his head, great with his feet as well. If you want another player who, who's very inventive, um, handful, always on the move, could score kind of goals, you go Robbie Keane. You could go Kevin Phillips, is the closest thing to Robbie Fowler that I've seen. Then you've got Rush and Aldridge, who are just legends of the game, although more of an inside the box player. Um, you've got Rush, who worked so hard without the ball, but in front of goal, scored so many goals. Again, left foot, right foot. You've got Michael Owen, you know, electric pace, um, who could really hurt teams. Michael. Carl Heinz Riedler was there for a Carlo, bit. Carlo, yeah. Obviously scored two in the Champions League final. Bruce Dortmund, I think, didn't he? Yeah, he definitely got one. Um, well, I'm, I'm tied between three. Okay. I'm tied between Robbie Keane, mm -hmm. John Aldridge, which is more of a heart decision. He's already on the bus, remember, though. Yeah. So Yoldo's got that. And, and there's that. And then there's Rushy. Mm -hmm. So who do you go, Rushy or Robbie Keane? Oh, it's tough. Oh, my. Imagine being the gaffer trying to make that decision. Got, yeah. <laughs> It's the Champions League final at Wembley. Champions League final Under at Wembley. Lights. You've gone there through on the bus with Aldo. He's kept you calm, chatted, you had a few laughs. You've got your team. You've got Bruce Rioch in the dugout, Ebo next to him. You've got, you've got 10 of your players picked and you're reading the team out in the dressing room and they're waiting. These guys, the three of them are sat there waiting for you to decide. They're looking at you. Do you know what? I'd have to let me missus make the call. <laughs> Um, which I'm sure Roy Evans did sometimes with that team. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going Robbie Keane. Robbie Keane gets in. Robbie gets in. What? Yeah. What is it about? Was he? Why did it work so well for him? And what? What? How do you have to play for him? Because sometimes, so, sometimes criticised for maybe being a bit too off the cuff and a bit too kind of unpredictable. But that's why he gets in. Because he, because he just. Yeah, he he was very unpredictable. But I think centre halves used to find him a, a nightmare. You know, he could he could go in behind, he could come to the ball, he could drift left, drift right, he could put a decent ball into the box crosswise. But he, he just always had that knack of being in the right place at the right time. But also he can he could make something out of nothing. Mm. So to have him on the pitch, if you manage to get the because I think the players have got on there would get him on the ball, mm. even if it was tight, you fancy him to score. You fancy him to work something. You know, whether it was like a little drag with the left to get onto his right, a little dink it over the keeper, or to side foot it, to flick it up and volley it. He was so inventive. And he, you know, I used to love playing with him. And I, I set him up a couple of times all in the way. Edda, you know, there was a couple of times feeding the ball into him. He had that, and then he'd come to the ball, he'd make space. Um, yeah, I enjoy playing with Robbie. Yeah, great lad as well. Well, which helps. 68 goals I think, for Ireland. Do you think he deserved to have played at a bigger club for longer to win more, based well, on the talent? Yeah, well, he played for Tottenham, didn't he? he? Got a move to Liverpool. It didn't suit him. You know, Stephen was playing in the in the role mm. Robbie should have played in at that time when he was bought. Um, he was just unfortunate. I think. Do you know what football sometimes, mate, is is timing. It's sometimes about timing. Um, you know, you. Your difference in, in how your career could be, you know, an injury here, you get in the team, an injury there, they need a player like that, they come by you, you get in the team, you play. Um, Robbie probably was unfortunate when it comes to the big, you say the big clubs, Tottenham were a big club mm -hmm. at that time. Um, he was just unfortunate. And I, and I think sometimes managers might have been frightened of, of paying big money for him, who was so maverick, one of the way he played, mm -hmm. so off the cuff. Um, sometimes you like that little bit of discipline with your centre forwards and you can handle them a little bit better. Robbie was never hand for that off the pitch, but on it, I can see why some mm. managers might go, well, maybe everything's got to go through him, maybe we've got to set a team up for him. And I can understand why sometimes the bigger clubs might have, you know, the Liverpools, the Arsenals, United might have shied away. But I'm, I reckon there would have been a lot of inquiries for Robbie through his career that he's never heard of. Inter Milan, he started at Inter. Mm. 
you know, maybe too young for him then, but, you know, great experience for him. Phenomenal player. Uh, looking at the squad, there's what, maybe two, three, four of the lads in that team are from that Liverpool team from the, the kind of mid-90s. Mm. Such a talented team. You spoke right at the top of this. Your regret is not winning anything. Why, why do you think it didn't quite happen? Do you think... Just but you know what, I could have, yeah, this question, I mean, it's a fantastic question and I could have took it World Cup, Ireland or a World Cup, whatever, you know, I could have picked the greatest, you know, in the biggest tournament in the world. Um, but I've gone with the biggest club competition and I've gone with the biggest players I played with. But I picked Liverpool um, because because it obviously it, it grates on me that we never won anything and I think... You know, I just think the reason, again, timing, you know, with Manchester United's, you know, class of 92 hadn't have come through for Fergie as they did in the manner in which they did, because there was no, you know, you've got to give them credit because mm. there's no, you know, there's no reason why they they couldn't have gone the other way. They could have all, you know, not turned out to be the players they were, could have easily have happened. But, you know, Fergie inherited this team from the youth or, or he was given this team from the youth. But you've still got to put youth and experience together, which was what he was phenomenal at. Um, and he, he managed to get Man United into a position every season where he only bought one or two players in. He never disrupted the team, three or four signings. He never did that. He always bought like for like. You know, he lost a big player, he brought a big player in. Beckham went, Ronaldo come in. Van Nistelrooy went, he brought whoever he brought in. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, he did it really well, Sir Alex. And, you know, yeah, it, it was just... It, there was a point, mate, where it was such a fine line, 95, 96, probably. It was at the time, there was such focus on it, the Premier League was getting bigger, you were the two biggest teams, you were the two most kind of glamorous teams as well. Britain at the time, you had the, you know, the Britpop thing, the pop culture, there was, yeah. it was a big, it was a lot going on. Do you think all that played a part? I don't, I don't mean that you guys were distracted by it, but the, the pressures of it, the focus of it was different. You were dealing with things that were, were kind of a bit new and they... Yeah, I th maybe, you know, there's, there's is that argument of discipline. You know, people do talk about Roy's discipline to Sir Alex's. I can honestly say, you know, we were right behind what we were trying to do. We were fully focused. Um, you know, we'd, we'd go out, we'd bump into the Manchester United a lot. You know, we were questioned, Jamie was questioned for going out with Louise. David Beckham was going out with Victoria at the time. You know, there were sim similarities between the two. You, you know, you couldn't really point it. You know, they were enjoying themselves more than more than they were. You know, we were all involved in this culture that was going on. I think one thing we might have might might have lacked, and I, and I talk about it now with today's team, is it, once you've won something, it mm. becomes a recipe, and it becomes a mindset. And you know, they you know they, they it was that fine line that season where they ended up doing the double, where Cantona scored in the cup final. You know, if we'd have won the cup that year. You know, I think we might have gone on and won the Premier League the year after. We just didn't have that belief that they had. Um, and it's massive in elite sport. The difference between coming second and first is massive. Because when you win something and you come first, does it, you feel like you belong there. You, you feel like, you know, we've beaten, we're the best. Mm. We're the best. Where we always come second or third, or got beaten in the final, and it was like the questions were always there: Can you win something? You know, it was always like like that slight doubt because you haven't won. And I think that was the difference. What, what was it like being in the middle of all that at the time, though? Because you the know, culture. You, well, just because you you were you know, let's not you were like right in the you spoke about David Beckham and stuff, but you, you had a lot of focus. You had you know you were on the front cover of FIFA '96. Everything, mate. Things yeah, like we that, like mad stuff like that. You know, other people who've been on the front cover of that are like D Dennis Bergkamp and yeah, yeah. Lionel Messi's been on. FIFA. It was slightly different back then because yeah. obviously the PlayStation wasn't what it was. <laughs> but, but, but but you know that's still a... yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I was you know adverts for Carlsberg and the world coming back from the World Cup was mental because we we come back as superstars. Mm. Me, Gary Kelly, and Phil Babb, and um, we were the young kids of the team. And we'd done really, really well. And we come back and we it was like, we went to watch you take that and we, we caused that much hassle. They asked us to leave. And we had to leave the concert because everyone was trying to get to us rather than watch you take that on stage. And that was just like mad. Um, we we could, literally couldn't go anywhere at that time. We, we were like superstars at that time. It was crazy. Just really, really cl crazy living in this mad bubble. You, you, but that's one concert. Like, just before we wrap things, we go back to the other concert, your other regret is Bono. Some people won't know the Bono 
situation. Well, yeah, that's I mean, another example of how crazy things had got at different times. Yeah, um, and I said probably one of the regrets. Um, we played Holland in the in the group stages of the two thousand and two World Cup qualifiers, and, and they come to Lansdowne, hadn't they? Um, and it was a matter of how many goals they were going to score, and they, they were going through. They booked their hotel and their plane, by the way, to go to Japan. It was literally how many of the goals they were going to score. And um, we, we had a physio at the time, Mick Byrne, who was like an old fella. He had no certificates, you know, no one questioned his treatments. Everyone just let him get on with it. But he was like the f grandfather of the team. And every, he was the person you used to go to with problems or mm. anything. He'd sort it, right? Oldish fella, lovely fella. Um, but he also had a lot of friends in, in sport and in the world of entertainment for some reason. So John Aldridge rings me before the game looking for tickets, as Aldo always does, right? So I sorted my tickets out and I said, listen, win, lose or draw, we're out tonight in Dublin. Have a night out tonight. No problem. So um, we win the game 1-0, come in the dressing room after the game. I'd scored the winner. Um, and it's quite an emotional dressing room. Everyone's hugging. Everyone's like, you know, except, except Roy. And... Um, because it's still only half the job had been done. We still hadn't qualified. But you beat you beat Holland one 0 You had yeah, like Van Nistelrooy, Van Broekhoek, Toku, yeah. all these Van der Sar, yeah. Hasselbank, Cliver. Um, they were they were all playing. They were, they, yeah. So you you beat them, you score. Yeah, and that night you two were on were live in Slane, hundred thousand in Slane, and what they did is they put big screens up at the concert and put our game on before they come out and sang. So you can imagine us mm. winning 1-0, 100,000 watching it slain. The atmosphere in the party, everyone's like drinking. The party was just phenomenal, like they were having. So it comes in the dressing room, Mick Bairn's giving me a big hug and he's gone, um, this is where it becomes unbelievable. Mick Bairn goes, I've just had Bono on the phone two minutes ago. I'm thinking, there's not a chance he's had Bono on the phone. And then he goes to me, um, you know they're in Slane tonight? So I said, yeah. He said, well, he wants you to walk out on stage uh, with him while he's singing a song uh, in your kit. So I said, what? He, so you've had Bono on the phone. Now he wants me to go to Slane. I said, how's he going to get me to Slane? Because it's now like whatever time it is. And the concert's in, in like 25, hour, half an hour. He says, got a helicopter waiting for you. It was like an answer for everything, right? <laughs> so now Bono's got a helicopter waiting for me to go to Slane, to go on stage in front of 100,000 people in me kit. So I can't even get a shower. I've got to go now in me kit. He's like, yeah. I'm like, Mick, I don't believe you. He went, I'm telling you, it's the truth. I said, listen, tell Bono after the concert, if he wants to come out with me and John Aldridge tonight <laughs> and have a pint, he's quite welcome because I'll be with Aldo, right? Not thinking for one minute this is true. So anyway, six months later, goes out with John Aldridge, has a great time. Concert, I don't even know. If the concert was on, but like, whatever. So six months later, this, this kid comes up to me, he gets his phone, he gets YouTube on his phone, and he goes, uh, is this true? Are you supposed to walk out at this point? Because I'm sure you are. And I'm thinking, what's he on about? You two, slain, right? Bono starts singing a song, and you can put it in YouTube now. I don't know if you can get it on in this podcast, <laughs> I'm sure you can share it, right? But Bono's singing along, he just stops, and he goes, just imagine, imagine, close your eyes, and imagine... It's Jason McAdee, and the whole place just erupts, 100,000 people, and that's the moment I'm supposed to walk out on stage. And you know when it was just one of them moments when you just thought, shit, <laughs> I got it wrong. <laughs> and I regret that moment. All for a night out with the man you're going to sit YouTube. next to on the bus going to the last <laughs> yeah, game as well. Yeah. Well, that's how much I, I, I hold him in high esteem, yeah. Final couple of questions then okay. for your final match. You've got it all set. You know who you're going to play with. You've got your manager. Yeah. You know where you're going to play. You know what it's going to be for. Yeah. Who are you playing against? Um, I've got to play it against them. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Game always gets to me, and they were a really good team. It's probably not a goal. Paris Saint-Germain back in 97. Leonardo gone. played and Ryan and all that. They beat us 3-0 in Paris, and then we beat them 2-0 at Anfield. Um, maybe they went on and played Barcelona in the final. It was the semi-final, that, and they went on and played Barcelona. It was like the UEFA Cup. Um, that always like hurts me a bit that result, um, but they had some really good players um, back then. Do you fancy that PSG? It's a bit of a glamour in it. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit glamorous. Modern day PSG is even a bit more. I could go. Man, I could go Man United '96 Cup final team just to get one over on them again because I think that team would beat them. Joyce, should we go? What should we go? Man United '96 Man United. or PSG? Man United Champions League. I know it's an all English affair, but it's one of them. Isn't it? 
Happens a lot these days. Uh, yeah. That's it. And if you could pick one player you played against to drop into your team that would make a difference, who would it be? Well, one of the best players I played against, um, and he was phenomenal, Kaka. Played against him for Brazil. Ronnie played as well. He nutmegged me that game, just left me a cheeky little wink as well. Um, it'd be Ronnie or, it, well, I played Maldini, Baresi, Mateus. God, the list's endless. I played, I've been really lucky. Um, but Kaka for me was just phenomenal. He was just up and down, grey feet. Locked the part, million dollars. Maldini, million dollars. Um, Kaka, Baresi, brilliant. Kaka. Kaka, 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 Kaka gets in. Um, okay, that's it. That's sorry, the... sorry. That question, that question, does he get into my... T so it's a player I played against, but he gets into my team. Well, I well I've got him... Gerard, Gerard and Keane in there. Do you know I'm going to change my mind? Because I've got to add... I've got to, there's a twist to that. I'm going to go Ronaldo. Because if Robbie Keane's not doing it, I can throw Ronaldo on, can't I? So, Ren oh, right. so you're going the original Ronaldo. Yeah. To be... I'm going the original Ronnie, yeah. Okay. The names, I like it. Uh, it's, it's a great game, it's, it's a great setup, it's a great way to bow out of a career. When you look back at your career, you've touched on it slightly already, but just to, to wrap up, is the, is the one thing you change of, of your career of life up until now with things? Would you, would you change anything looking back? I would stay at Liverpool six months longer to the end of the season. I left in November, I should have stayed. They'd done the treble after that as well. I should have stayed. <laughs> I would have stayed. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure. Top man. Thank you for being Top a guest. Um, that. Yeah, that is it for this episode. Remember, it is never too late for one last match. Brilliant stuff there from Jason. You actually forget some of the fabulous players he played alongside during his career. Uh, thanks very much for listening this week. And just a reminder to get involved with Who Knows Wins. It's the new app that's really shaking up the sports entertainment industry. You can challenge your mates for real money and, crucially, for bragging rights. This is what Who Knows Wins is all about. Download the app, create your league, select your fixtures across football, rugby, tennis, horse racing, whatever you like, then set your entry stake. You make your predictions and then invite your pals in and challenge them to beat your guesswork. Grow that pot and then win the money. And when it comes to bragging rights, of course, winner takes all. Get it on the App Store or Google Play right now. Who Knows Wins? Put your money where your mates are. And while you're there downloading it, do make sure you rate, review and subscribe to One Last Match, where next week our guest will be the former Manchester United defender, Gary Pallister. And remember, it's never too late for One Last Match. <laughs>